everyone, I'm really excited about today's topic because we are going to talk all about European sunscreens. And to help me, I have Dr. Bebe Du Harper. She is a dermatologist in the UK, and she's going to basically give us all the information that we need. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Susan. I love European sunscreens. I'm really happy that this is something that's now being highlighted on your channel. Love to talk about it more. All right, so Dr. Bebe, I think it's safe to assume that most of my viewers are avid sunscreen wearers, but if somebody is watching and they haven't really taken to sunscreen yet, what would be the reasons to wear sunscreen? Sunscreen is an important aspect of sun protection in general. So, um, you know, when you're going outside and you're exposing yourself to sunlight, it's important to seek shade, avoid really, really intense sun. And if you are out and about and there's no way of avoiding it, then sunscreen is a really, really useful way to protect yourself. And the main reason for this, I would say, is to prevent skin cancers. So as a dermatologist, a huge amount of our work is uh, treating and preventing skin cancers. And secondary to that, we also know that the sun is absolutely really critical for causing skin aging. So if you are concerned about skin aging or pigmentation, I would recommend that you wear a sunscreen um, even a daily sunscreen. Even inside the house, right? Yeah, because we know that UVA, which is the longer wavelength form of ultraviolet radiation, that can come through the windows and that actually penetrates deeper into your skin and can cause things like collagen damage over time. So wearing sunscreen indoors is important for things such as skin aging. So before we shot this video, Dr. Bebe actually sent me a package with some amazing sunscreens from the UK, some of them being European also. After trying some of these sunscreens that you sent me. I have to say I'm, I'm really sad for us here in, you, in the United States because they feel so much better. From what I can tell, you have much better filters. They seem like they're so much more improved. They feel better. Like you can use them on children, for instance, and so the potential of irritation seems lower. It seems like there's antioxidants. They last longer. I mean, we just were missing out on all of these benefits. So tell me what are kind of like the main differences of European sunscreens versus you know, sunscreens that we have here? The main difference is that in Europe, m many, many more filters have been approved and therefore they're able to be used in uh, sunscreen formulations. So essentially the chemists who are formulating these sunscreens just have so many more options to formulate with. And the filters that they're able to use um, are newer ones that are known to be less irritating to the skin in general. So you're less likely to have an adverse reaction, uh, less likely to get stinging eyes and things like that. And then also ultimately you get a more cosmetically elegant finish. So some of the filters that are older are not quite as photostable as the newer ones. That's why they're able to provide a sort of longer lasting protection as well. Additionally, some of these sunscreens are actually formulated with antioxidants in them as well. So the Helio Care line, for example, contains their own unique antioxidant called Fern Block. And these antioxidants, similar to the way a vitamin C work, they work by mopping up free radicals, reactive oxygen species in the skin, um, which contribute to collagen degradation and skin aging. I was actually reading that avobenzone, which is one of our main filters for UVA protection here in the yeah. United States, yeah. that it breaks down really quickly. So, yeah. you know, you put it on your skin, but you're, it's like the countdown starts basically. I mean, I, I guess that's the way it is for all filters, but at the same time, this one apparently breaks down really, really quickly. So that yeah. UVA protection that we're potentially getting from it is quickly going away. It's definitely not a really good one for that. I've also read that it is possible to stabilize it with certain methods that chemists are able to use. So I think that some formulations may be superior to others, but I've definitely read the same about avobenzone. But the novel filters are designed to be photostable and have been tested and shown to be photostable in a lot of these sunscreens. So I think obviously, that's better than something that you know will break down over time. All right, so let's talk about specifically some of the filters there, the sunscreen filters in Europe and the UK and Australia and Asia, basically everywhere else, but in the United <laughs> States that are available. So some of the filters that are commonly found in European sunscreens are ones such as Tinazorb S and Tinazorb M and also the Juvenal filters as well. And then there are also some proprietary filters that belong to specific brands. So L'Oreal, for example, have um, developed of their own filters. Um, they are actually available in America, but they had to go through a very arduous FDA process in order to get them to your shelves. Because of that, they're actually much, much more expensive as well in the US than they are in the UK. Aven 
also have their own filter now. So those are the only two brands which have their own proprietary filters. But yeah, so those are kind of an examples of a few of the ones that we have in Europe. You know, a question that I have is whether, you know, you have conversations in the UK and in Europe that are similar to the ones that are had here in the United States about sunscreens. You know, there are a lot of sometimes even just misconceptions about, you know, the differences between the different filters, the mineral filters, the chemical filters, and whether they're safe for sensitive skin or, you know, if they're even just safe for you in general and stuff. Mm. I feel like these are really big conversations here and I wonder if they, they actually happen in the UK too. I would say it's to a much less extent and I think that's partly because of the types of sunscreens that we have here compared to in the States the filters are slightly different and I think also the way that the FDA have sort of made comments about chemical filters in the US has obviously led to dermatologists there feeling a little bit more concerned whereas in the UK we haven't had any kind of messaging from our regulatory bodies or from the British Association of Dermatologists so you know we, we don't have the quite the same kinds of concerns I would also say that surprisingly we actually find it a little bit harder to get mineral sunscreens in the UK so the vast majority of our sunscreens I would say are hybrid or chemical slash organic that's sort of the other type of terminology actually finding a pure mineral sunscreen is a little bit challenging here whereas in America there's so many different mineral options because it's so popular and a lot of the companies in America I think have just innovated a lot in in terms of creating more cosmetically pleasing mineral formulations so I think there's just a lot of variety of great mineral options in the States. It's very eye-opening to hear you say that there aren't as many mineral sunscreens available there because it kind of just goes to show how I guess wording and positioning, especially from a government agency like the FDA, how that can really change the perception of yeah. what's being used. And I think also the, the the mineral or inorganic options in the States, they are really great. There's lots of cosmetically pleasing ones and zinc oxide is a really great uh, sunscreen filter, but it isn't for everyone. And I think that it can be quite limiting for people of color because the mineral or inorganic options can um, often lead to a slightly ashen tone or white cast, which isn't desirable for a lot of people. Whereas the organic and chemical filters, people are often able to get a much more transparent finish, especially you know if you aren't able to cover it with makeup or you don't wear makeup at all, for example, if you're a man, like a lot of men, then that might not be something that they would be inclined to wear on a daily basis. All right, so this leads to truly the huge difference between European sunscreens and American sunscreens and that is the filters that you use we are very limited here in the United States and as I use more and more sunscreens here I realize that these limitations it's very sad for us that we don't have the filters that you have in the UK and in Europe so don't forget that in the past you know sunscreens were all about UVB and it's only been more recently that UVA was understood to be as harmful as it is now. So a lot of the newer filters are more UVA specialists. And I think that's, from my understanding, the, the main thing that's lacking in the sort of US sunscreen filter options when it comes to organic or chemical sunscreens. Whereas zinc does provide great UVA protection, but then obviously, you know, that's in the mineral category. So yeah, in, the, in Europe and in Australia and in Asia, there are lots of um, different filters which can offer really great UVA protection and are also stable, photostable, so they're able to work more effectively over a longer period of time. I mean, we say to reapply every two hours because the filters can break down and also just because of wear and tear while you're while yeah. it's actually on your skin. Yeah. Is that the same in Europe? The general guidance as a sort of blanket policy is the same. And I think that's because from a public health messaging point of view, that's the safest thing to recommend. However, individual brands have um, created sunscreens that have been tested to and shown to last longer on the skin. They have the label of long lasting on the bottle. Those are really great options because really it's the duration that you're out in the sun is often going to be longer than two hours. I mean, I don't know how many people actually reapply sunscreen, but it is quite difficult to do. For example, you know, if you're out playing sport or you're on the beach, it is a hassle to, you know, if you're covered in sand to then rub sunscreen on top of that and do all of those things. And all of the human factors in sunscreen use are so important. And I think just 
making it easier to use and making it more enjoyable to use, I think are really important in terms of improving adherence and people actually using it. Yeah, I think so too, for sure. You know, a couple of the sunscreens that I have been really loving, especially for my children, are EV Technology yeah. and the P20, yeah. Sun Care for Kids. Oh uh, yeah. I, I mean, I feel like these are superior sunscreens. These are the best sunscreens I have ever used, especially for my kids, just hands down. What do you yeah. think about them? I've used both of those as well. I know that the P20 Sun Care for Kids is a, a bit of a cult favorite in the beauty community because they share the UVA protection factor and it's very high. And that's something which is obviously really great. And the EV technology one, I was kindly sent as well. And it's really great. I use it myself, also on my baby. The texture is really enjoyable when you're rubbing it in. And if you're rubbing in a cream, sometimes like children might not like it so much, but I think because it's got this like foamy effect, it's almost like it's quite enjoyable for them. You know, kids right. love bubbles and things like that. So I really love both of those products. You know, I have to ask because here in the US again, we basically brands are not allowed to say that they are waterproof. I don't I don't actually see waterproof, but I see very water resistant on some of the packaging of these products. Yeah. And also this one, I mean, it says it protects up to 10 hours. That almost feels unbelievable. What are your thoughts on it as a dermatologist? So in order for brands to do that, I mean, this is just my understanding of EU regulations. They have to do their own testing to show that they're able to make those claims. So I'm not privy to exactly what tests all of those sunscreen companies have done. But I know, for example, that the EV sunscreen, um, they did tests where they came in and out of salt water multiple times, towel down in between, and then tested the SPF after all of that had occurred and showed that they were still obtaining a really high SPF, I think over, still around sort of SPF 50, despite, you know, coming in and out of water and so on. So I do think that, you know, when these claims are made, they have to show evidence to back up those claims. And I think that it's great that we are able to get that information from the bottle and then make better choices in terms of how we're protecting ourselves. You know, one of the big differences also that I find is you know, in, in regulations, right, between the United States and other countries, like in the UK, for instance, one of those really great regulations that you have is that I feel like UVA protection is a little bit clearer there than it is here in the United States. I don't know if it's clearer, it's definitely different. So. You may have noticed if you are an avid purchaser of sunscreens that all of the sunscreens across the world seem to have slightly different labeling when it comes to UVA. So in, in the UK, we have two different things. So one is a EU wide thing, which is the UVA with a circle around it, which means that the UVA protection factor stated is at least a third of the SPF. So as a rule of thumb, if it's an SPF 50, it's should be at least a 16 or more. And then in America, it just says broad spectrum. And then in Asia, it has the PA system. So it says PA++++. And apparently a PA++++, so as in four pluses, is about equivalent to UVA protection factor of around 16. But it caps out right. there in terms of what it actually tells you. So it could actually be better than that, but we just don't know. So the, the current labeling of UVA protection is quite confusing, I think, for consumers, especially if you are buying sunscreens from all over the world, because there's just not a great deal of consistency. And then one other thing is that in, in the UK, we additionally have another rating, which is the Boots Star Rating System. And that's one that a pharmacy or a drugstore in the UK came up with. You know, generally we recommend looking for a four or a five star rating in the Boots system. So it goes to a maximum of five. I mean, at least you have those options though. Here in the United States, basically brands just have to say broad spectrum and yeah. that's it. And yeah. I actually, I think they have to all now be broad spectrum protection, yeah. Yeah. but it's not really clear uh, what it is that you're getting as far yeah. as that protection. It's it's really, really unclear. I mean, I think it's nice that we have the boot system, for example, because, you know, you can go around the store and look at what all the different sunscreens actually provide and you can compare them a little bit. You know, a lot of sunscreens will provide, say, three stars or four stars and some will be five stars, but actually it's not that many which provide five star 
protection on the boot system. So this is an area which um, hopefully there'll be better information on in the future because I think as consumers who are now more and more aware of the importance of UVA that we actually get clearer labeling on what the protection we're actually getting is. So before we wrap up the video, I just wanna hear a few reasons why these are your go-to sunscreens. All right, so first up, you sent me this one from Cetaphil. Yeah, so I've emptied this bottle many, many times and I've just used it as a daily facial sunscreen for a few years actually. I really love it because it's just very cosmetically pleasing and it provides like a nice glow. And I was curious because there's actually an almost identical looking product in the US, but I think it highlights where there's like a difference because the one that I can buy contains tinazol and the one that you get in the States looks exactly the same. The bottle's identical, but it doesn't contain tinazol. So it's actually functionally a slightly different product. And the other thing is it's actually really affordable. So, you know, I bought this, I think for like seven or eight pounds in the UK, which I think is a great price point. You know, I've recommended it to lots of male friends and they all like it as well. So yeah, I think it's a great general everyday product that, um, you know, that's quite affordable. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I've been using it, I love it. I actually have the American version too, the US version. They both are great. I'd say that it's one of my favorites of the more affordable sunscreens yeah. here in the United States. But I'll say that this one just looks a little bit better, just like a touch better yeah. on the skin. Yeah. All right, so next up is this one from Ultra Sun. It is their SPF 50 plus and it is tinted. Tell me about it. I was first introduced to Ultrasun by a fantastic facialist or esthetician called Andy Millwood. And I really like this Ultrasun product because it's tinted. I think I've sent you the exact same one as, as the one that I use, which is honey tint, um, because we have a similar skin tone. And I use it kind of as um, makeup, basically. I'm sure a lot of people know this who watch your channel, but tinted sunscreens are thought to be slightly better in terms of protecting against visible light and pigmentation induced by visible light. So for someone who may suffer with pigmentation concerns or melasma, a tinted sunscreen like this is a great option. I actually just used this one yesterday for the first time oh, yeah. and it looked perfect. It's perfect on my skin tone, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right, and then the last couple that you sent me are the Helio Care, the Fluid Cream, and then this Event Intense Protect. Yeah, so the Helio Care line, which um, I mentioned earlier, they have this patented fern block, which is this antioxidant technology. So they're able to provide additional antioxidant protection, which I think is a great innovation in a sunscreen because they're all about protecting the skin from damage. And the Helio Care line is great. They have so many different formulations. The oil-free gel sunscreen is a really popular one for those who suffer with acne. I chose this one for you because I know you have dry skin, so I thought this one might be a little bit more hydrating. And the Event sunscreen I think is really cool because it has this novel filter in it, which has really long wavelength protection. And, you know, I think it's great that new filters are being created and that, you know, there is innovation in this area so that um, we're able to get higher quality products that provide more extensive protection. I love that. You know, it's funny, the Helio Care, I actually take the Helio Care supplement, the oh, pill, right. yes. on a daily basis, and I love it. I, I truly feel like it has helped my melasma oh, really? a lot, Gr like greatly. Oh, I great. really do. It's the same molecule that they use in their sunscreens. I think it will say fern block on that bottle. But yeah, it's from this fern called Polypodium leucotomos. And they've done lots of research to show that it boosts the effects of their sunscreens and can be a supplement in terms of sun protection, which I think is really great. I think so too. Anything that we can do to protect ourselves from the sun, for sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Bebe, for joining us. This was really eye-opening for me. I had a lot of realizations while listening to you talk about, you know, the different filters and everything that, that basically we're missing out on here in the yeah. United States. I'm so excited to continue using all of these sunscreens that you sent me, so thank Thank you so much. No, you're very welcome. And just let me know whenever you need some more. <laughs> Thank you, that sounds good. Now I know I have a connection here. So yeah. I, I, I have somebody, I have somebody that can help uh, restock me. Yeah, exactly. Where can everyone find you on social media? So you can find me on Instagram. My username is Dermatology Demystified, where I post about things such as skincare, skin biology, skin science. Thank you so much. I'll let you get to your baby because I know that you are a newish mom, so. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.